You're going to see your parents 15 more times before they die. This is the opening line of this new book, The Five Types of Wealth, written by Saho Bloom. And Saho was kind enough to send me an early copy to read and review. So in this video, I'm going to break down five lessons from the five types of wealth that are going to completely change your life, especially if you're in your 20s, grinding to create an amazing career or build a business and set up your financial base. And the first principle from this book is that you've already achieved goals that you said would make you happy. Let's go all the way back to high school. See, in high school, all I thought was, once I get into a good college, once I just get that enrollment paper, I'll finally be happy. Everything will be set for me. Then I got into a good college. And once I was a freshman, I thought, hey, once I get that first software engineer internship, I'm solid. My financial base and career base is set up. And once I got that internship, I was like, okay, once I get a FANG level internship, that'll set me for life. That name will carry me forever. And once I got that FANG internship, I was like, okay, now that I have this internship, once I get a full-time job that pays into six figures, we're good. Then I did that. And then I thought, okay, once I quit this job to start a business, I'll be truly happy. Then I achieved that last year. And over the past year, I thought, okay, once this business is profitable, I'll finally be satisfied and happy with my life. And it's currently profitable and I'm still the same human being I was five years ago. So if you're deluding yourself and thinking that once you achieve some kind of external accolade, once something happens, then you'll finally be satisfied and content with the rest of your life. You're sorely mistaken. You're mentally hijacking yourself. And if you're not happy right now, no random goal external achievement is going to change that. You have to do that yourself. Saho Bloom tells a story about how just three or four years ago, he would have given anything. He prayed every single night to have a healthy child. Him and his wife have been trying to have a kid and they were experiencing fertility issues. Over 13 or 14 months, they had no luck and it was devastating. They struggled every day with the fact that they couldn't conceive. And what do you know? Three or four years later, Saho Bloom was pissed off that his young kid is annoying him in his office. Think about that. This guy was begging every night they would one day have a kid, and three or four years later, he's annoyed that his toddler is throwing things and distracting him from work. These are examples of the arrival fallacy, which is a false assumption that once something happens, then you'll experience lasting contentment and satisfaction. And it is almost never true. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that these achievements don't matter, that money doesn't matter at all. But once you have your financial base set, once you have food, water, shelter, all of which can be achieved with just three to $5,000 a month, no level of external success or achievement is going to radically change the way you feel about yourself or your contentment in life. And I know you've probably already heard this a million times from every single successful individual out there. And you've probably told yourself they can say that because they're successful. I'll be different. Once I hit this monetary or career goal, everything's gonna change. And trust me, it's not true. I went through the same lie Five or six years ago, I earned literally zero dollars. I was living at home and I was just as unhappy then as I am now running a profitable business where I earn more than double what I did in my nine to five job. It doesn't change. Nothing's going to change. The external achievements and income really do not change that fundamental existence, which comes purely from within. Of course, if you're struggling to put food on the table, pay rent, fine. Money does take care of those external issues. But as soon as you're beyond that point, which can be achieved by almost every nine to five job, your happiness and satisfaction has to be built through other areas of your life, not your career. Trust me, I was the same human being applying for my first software engineering internship as I was applying for my first full-time job as I was growing a profitable business. And once you realize that no achievement, accolade, nothing like that is going to change who you are, it's terrifying, but it's also a breath of fresh air. Because, spoiler alert, you realize that you're actually living in the good old days right now. That 10, 20 years from now, no matter where you are, you're going to be looking at whatever you were doing at this time of your life and thinking, wow, those are the good old days. I miss those times when I was taking the trash out and hanging out with my college friends. No matter how much you feel like your life sucks right now, this is the time that you'll actually value 30 years from now. And as cliche as it sounds, this actually changed the way I see the world because I was stuck in that loop, just looking for some external future where I had some arbitrary revenue goal, get some job offer, and then thinking everything was gonna change. And if you don't break that loop, you'll be stuck in the cycle of always expecting the next thing to change your life when it really never will. The realization, that you already have everything you need to be happy and satisfied, that is the one realization that will actually change your life. Now, the second principle from this book that really changed the game for me is the idea that we're not playing the wrong game, we're playing the game wrong. So what does it mean to play a game wrong? Well, one surefire way to play a game wrong is to be measuring the wrong score. 
our scoreboard is completely messed up. What does that mean? Well, right now, the biggest scoreboard that is so easy for pretty much every single human on the planet to understand is money. Money is so easy to measure. Everybody knows what the power of a dollar is globally. Everyone knows what it means to make six figures. Everybody understands that. And because it's so easy to measure, that is what most of us optimize for. Most people spend their entire lives obsessing over that one metric. Think about it this way. Let's talk about Warren Buffett, someone worth $130 billion. This guy has more wealth and money that we will ever even see 1% of. He has all the status in the world. He can meet anyone he wants. He owns a fleet of private jets. He can go on any vacation, have any experience, literally do anything any human could possibly imagine. He has everything you think you want when it comes to career and monetary success. But let me ask you one question. Would you swap places with them? If this guy has everything you think you want, all the monetary status, career success known to man, why wouldn't you trade places with him right now? It's because he's 94 years old. And chances are Warren Buffett would spend $130 billion and everything is achieved to be exactly where you are right now. He would give everything to be you and you wouldn't give anything to be him. So who's actually richer right now? You're a time billionaire and that's more valuable than all the money in the world. So maybe money isn't everything, yet we act like it is. People will give up their quality of life move across the country, leave their friends and family and health behind just for a 20% salary raise. They let their relationships, physical and mental health suffer, doing something they don't enjoy just to climb the corporate ladder. Your life may be enabled by money, but it will be defined by everything else. Here's another exercise Sahel Bloom talks about in this book. Visualize being in your 80s. What do you see? When I think about me being 80s, I imagine myself in a rocking chair, reading a book, sipping a nice cup of coffee, maybe playing with my grandkids and going for a walk with my partner in a beautiful area in nature. You know what I don't see? Solving leak code problems, pushing code, applying for another software engineer job, trying to get to L101, provided AI doesn't kill us all. So if money matters as much as you think it is, why would you not trade places with Warren Buffett nor do you see yourself coding when you're 80 or grinding to get another software engineer job. Money is an enabler, but it is simply not the goal. See, Sahil gives us four other metrics we can use to build a fulfilling life. And this book dives into detail about what they are and how to optimize them. Specifically, they are time wealth, social wealth, physical wealth, mental wealth, and then finally financial wealth. And yes, financial is on there, but it is simply fuel for the other four metrics. Do you see what I mean when I say we're playing the game wrong? Most of us are over-optimizing financial wealth and under optimizing the four other areas that should be the end goal, not something to be sacrificed just for some arbitrary revenue goal. If you optimize for the other four areas, yes, you need money, but your life instantly becomes a lot better. Now, how do you actually do that? How do you optimize these four other more important areas of life without sacrificing your financial base? Because you're probably thinking, I'm on, I get it, I understand that relationships and health matter, but I'm too busy. I don't have time to work out. I don't have time to spend with my friends and family. I need to get that promotion because I need to pay my bills. And the secret here is the idea of a dimmer switch. If you think about a light switch, right? Most light switches are just on and off. It's either at full blast or it's completely dark. But on the other end, we have a dimmer switch. This thing can go from zero to 100 and everywhere in between. And most people think that everything in life has to be a binary light switch. If you're focusing on your career, you have to spend 100% of effort on that and you can't work out, can't go to the gym, can't maintain any of your relationships. I have so many friends in their early 20s tell me, I'm on, I just don't have time to go to the gym. I'm too busy with school, I'm too busy with work. Once I finish this season of life, then I'll have more time. And these people somehow, quote unquote, find the time during their summer, winter, or spring breaks to work out, but not during the school year. And they justify it by telling me they just don't have the time to do it. But let me ask you one question. You're telling me the reason that you don't work out is because you don't have time? Well, open your phone and show me your screen time. I'm literally talking to you right now. Pause this video, scroll up, click on settings, look at your screen time. If it's over an hour, you're deluding yourself. You have time to work out and eat healthy. You're just choosing not to. See, none of these things have to be a light switch, okay? You could spend less than 30 minutes a day doing a nice home workout and maintain your physical health or even improve it while also prioritizing your career. Yet most people trick themselves into thinking that it's all or nothing. That's the idea of a dimmer switch. You can dim down some of these metrics to give fuel to the other ones, but nothing has to go to zero. What does that mean in reality? Well, it means you spend 25, 30 minutes daily doing a really fast home workout. That's enough to maintain your health or even improve it slightly. Or when it comes to social wealth, that means that on your commute to work or your walk to class, you call your friends and family members and you catch up with them. Or for your mental wealth, it means you listen to a podcast or an audiobook while you're on your commute as well, just to increase your knowledge of the world and develop your skills even more. Do you see what I mean? I'm not saying quit your job to party 24 seven. I'm telling you that 
there are strategic moves you can deploy to prioritize other elements of your life while also pushing one of them. The keys to not have this all or nothing thinking, the idea that you don't work out for six months straight, then during spring break, you work out for three hours a day, and then you go back to not working out for another year. It means you don't just not see your friends for three years straight and then just have some amazing holiday, expecting you not to fix your relationship, but make time for them every day or at least a few times a week. Now, on the physical health angle, a lot of people, again, tell me, I just don't have time. I want to prioritize my career and therefore I can worry about physical health later on. But if you actually look at the research, actually dive into studies, if you spend two hours a day, one hour eating healthy and one hour exercising, you will net 10 years of healthy life. And that's after subtracting the time you spend, those two hours a day, on those activities. If you subtract the several years you spend in your lifespan eating healthy and exercising, you still get 10 years of healthy life back. So don't tell me you don't have time to exercise. How can you possibly not exercise when you bridge 10 years of life and healthy life too? See, when I was in college, I was spending $250 a month on personal training and nutrition coaching. And most people back then looked at me and said, Amon, you're crazy. Why would you spend that money? 250 is way too much. That's not worth it. And I was a college student, right? I was 21 years old. I was using my internship money to funnel that into lifting coaching and developing myself there. But if doing that can net me 10 years of life, for just a few thousand dollars a year, what the hell, it's an unbelievably useful purchase to make. Yet so many people have the short-term thinking of thinking, oh, it's too expensive, I can't spend a couple hundred dollars a month on progressing my health, even though we get years and years and years back. So stop telling yourself that you don't have time to invest in these other four areas, because it's simply a lie. As Richard Feynman says, the first principle is to not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. The next idea from the five types of wealth that really changed the way I see the world is the idea that there are different seasons of life that not right now equals never. And if you go back to the opening line, you're going to see your parents 15 more times before they die. Well, think about it. A lot of people, if you're in your 20s like I am, most of us, our parents are in their 50s or maybe early 60s. And if you only see them a couple times a year, you really only have 50 or 60 more spots left before you never have the chance again. And that sounds a bit harsh, but it's important to realize that not right now, thinking that, oh, I'll spend time with my friends and family, especially my parents, when I'm financially successful, when I have my career set, well, that ship has sailed. And it's even more urgent because right now my parents are in their early 60s and late 50s. And at this point of their life, they're still healthy enough to travel, to do a bunch of activities, to walk around. And in five to 10 years, that probably is not going to be the case. When my dad is in his 70s, he's not going to want to fly around the world and spend all day doing activities. He's going to sit at home and relax. So if I want to spend time with my parents and engage in those activities, travel with them, see new things, have new experiences, now is the only time I can do that. Not right now equals never. See, for so long, I had this limiting idea that, oh, I don't want to travel with my parents. It's too boring. I want to go with my friends with my siblings, not my parents. They're too old. I don't want to spend time with them. Maybe I'll do that down the line when I'm a bit older. But after this decade, I will literally never be able to travel with them ever again. So why don't I take every single opportunity I have to join them on their trips? When they're flying to some new country to see it or visiting some different city and they invite me, why would I say no? The other things in my life, my career, my friends, even my siblings, they will be there for the next few decades, but my parents won't, or at least they won't be in good health. So now is the time to take advantage of that. And this doesn't just apply to your parents. This applies to every aspect of your life. Life. If you're someone in your 30s and you have young kids, well, spoiler alert, your kids after age 10 are most likely not going to want to spend time with you. When they're teenagers, when they're adults, when they're focusing on their career in school, but before age 10, you are everything to your kids. All they want to do is spend time with you. So that is the time to take advantage of that. When your kids want you to read them a bedtime story, when they want you to tuck them into bed, when they want you to go to the playground and play with them, do it because after they're 10 years old, that's just never going to come back. And your career is always going to be there. So why would you give up quality time with your kids to focus heavily on your career? And even for people who don't have kids, like most likely me and you, looking back, there were so many unnecessary sacrifices I made with the goal of prioritizing my career or school. If I think back to high school or even college, so many people were stressed about their grades, about getting into a good school, about getting an internship, that they gave up a lot of those experiences that would never come back. I'm going to be honest, half the things I learned in high school or achieved in high school matter literally zero right now. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying school is important. I think it does matter and it does have a compounding effect throughout the rest of your life. But if you're deluding yourself into thinking, sacrificing every social hangout with my friends, 
not engaging in experiences you can only do in high school. Hell, people who didn't go to prom because they were like, oh, I need to study for a test. That stuff never comes back. That's one time in your life to take advantage of that experience, and you will never, ever be able to do that again. If you go back to the idea of a dimmer switch, the problem is that people have all or nothing thinking. They think that if their friends invite them to dinner, they either have to spend the entire day with them or spend zero time with them at all. When in actuality, you can spend one to two hours hanging out with them, come back early, and then focus on your exam. Things are not black and white like that. There's a way you can navigate this process of prioritizing the things that actually matter. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying embrace degeneracy, get blackout drunk every night. This is not hedonism, it's investing in the things that really matter in the long term. If you're telling yourself that I'm not gonna hang out with my high school friends because I'll do that once I get into a good college, or if you're telling yourself, I'm not going to hang out with my college friends because I'll do that once I get a good job, newsflash, you'll never be able to do that again. I am less than two years out of college. And do you know the number of people I stay in contact with? Two or three. Two or three people I knew in college, I still talk to less than two years out. And those people, I see them one to three times a year. So if I deluded myself into thinking, oh, I'm going to hang out with these people, have these relationships after I get a good job. Well, too late, they're gone. And I'll never be able to access that time ever again. In college, we hung out almost every single day. And if I'd given that up with some delusion of, oh, it's gonna come back in the future, well, too late. Life is an optimization problem. And you need to expand from just one metric to all five. This is all super complicated, right? How do you know what to optimize at what given moment? It's a bit complicated. How do you know what to dial back and what to dial up on the dimmer switch. Sahil introduces this idea of the life razor. This is how you simplify your decision making and optimize the metrics that really matter. In general, a razor is any rule of thumb that makes decision making easier. Famously, Occam's razor states that the simplest answer is usually the right one. The explanation with the fewest assumptions is most likely the one you should go with. And your life razor is a simple phrase that allows you to make better decisions and know what to optimize based on your stage of life. And originally this idea came from Mark Randolph, who is the founder and former CEO of Netflix. His life razor was, I never miss my Tuesday dinner with my wife. See, when he was growing Netflix in the early days, it was a fast-moving startup, eventually becoming one of the most valuable companies in the world. So there were always reasons that he could work evenings, weekends, essentially never stop grinding. Yet even so, his ultimate rule, his life razor is that every Tuesday, I'm leaving at 5 p.m. to go to dinner with my wife, no matter what. It didn't matter what customers were angry at him. It didn't matter if there was another amazing opportunity. It didn't matter if there was a work meeting. By 4.45 p.m., he was out the door every single Tuesday, no matter what. And that is how he preserved his relationship with his wife and also kids while growing a company like Netflix. Sahil's life razor is, I will coach my son's sports teams. And that might seem all these specific, right? Like, why is this the one thing that he focuses on? Well, it's because that defines his identity. If he's the kind of person to coach his son's sports teams, it means that, one, he's heavily involved in his son's life. He's spending time with him on a daily basis. It means that him and his son like each other. He has a good relationship. He also has a good standing in the community. I mean, other parents are about to trust him as well. So it's not just that one thing. It's about the kind of person he is. And there's so many other life phrases in this book. I mean, he gives several examples like a mid-40s investment banker saying that his one is, I wake up early and do hard things. Another person's life razor is, I always tuck my kids into bed. Another mid-20s consultant is, I never let a friend cry alone. A mid-60s retiree has a life razor of, I do one good deed every day. So they're all over the place, right? It's not just one thing that everyone sticks to. And these also change. Like the person who says that they always tuck their kids into bed, Bed, that's something you only do for 10 or 15 years max before it moves on to something else. So I want you to think, what is my life razor? What is the one statement that I can stick to for the next five or six years that defines the stage of life I'm in? Some actionable characteristics of a good life razor are that they're controllable. So it's something you have to actually be able to implement, not something that someone else defines for you. They're ripple creating. So this single statement has effects in other areas of your life, not just that one part. And finally, it's identity defining. It's based on the type of person you are. And after reading this book, I actually sat there for about an hour and tried to come up with my life razor. And I went through a lot of things, waking up early, building a business, working out. But I finally decided at this stage of life, my life razor is I will never say no to a family vacation or a friend's trip. That is completely random. You probably would not have predicted that for me, right? But the reason why it's important to me is one, time with my family is scarce, especially with my parents, you know, entering their 60s. There may not be another decade where I can actually spend quality time with them on a vacation. And two, it's the same with my friends. None of us have kids right now. I'm sure when we do have kids in the next five to 10 years, 
there will be almost no time to go on quality trips with each other. So might as well never say no to that and prioritize that time right now. And my life razor would be different if I was getting invited every single week to go on a trip. That would be too much. But at this point in my life, there is not an abundance of opportunities to spend time with my deep friends or family members. So might as well just take every one of those opportunities, optimize for that, and then work will fill in the rest of the cracks anyway. Everything I've talked about in this video is literally in the first 20% of this book. So honestly, if you like anything I said right now, I'd highly recommend you check it out. You can use my link in the description to buy it. I get a bit of a kickback for that, but honestly, you can find it anywhere books are sold. I don't really mind. And finally, if you want to hear my thoughts on the rest of the book, more actionable tips, advice, strategies to living a fulfilling life, you can subscribe to Thoughtful Thursday. The next few editions of my newsletter, I'm going to be writing specifically about the rest of this book, the tactics for engaging in physical health, social health, mental health, and how you can build a financial base that fuels the other important areas of your life. So you can subscribe to that at the link down below. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video.